Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is going to be, I believe, our third episode in the Budget Worship Series. For those of you who haven't um, really met me in an official way, I didn't. I don't remember if I introduced myself last week, but I'm Matt. Uh, you know Rob from Budget Worship Leaders. Um, I am the new silent partner, and I am going to be more heavily involved. And we're going to also bring in some other people into this, uh, some experts, some some friends. Some people that have input into what we're doing. Uh, we're going to try to keep this dynamic and introduce as many faces and just so you're not just staring at us all day every time. Uh, we're going to have some motion stuff where we actually move around and showcase some some tools, some apps, some things like that. Um, for today's episode, we're going to delve into a subject that might be considered a hot topic for some. I know for me it has been. Uh, we're going to talk about personal mixers and in-ear monitoring. Um, before we do that though, I'd like to just take a moment. I'd like to throw this over for a second and show you a couple of things about our setup today because what we're doing today is going to be a really good example of how we're trying to um, move this thought process forward and showcase how you can fix real world problems on a budget. Um, I'd like to swap the shot real quick to the uh, monitor shot and the camera shot. Um, Thank you, man. Uh, so for those of y'all that aren't familiar with this, this is a new uh, camera setup that a company, Logitech, has come up with. I expect other companies will follow suit, but this is a wireless streaming setup. I'm not going to get into the details heavily, but I just wanted to showcase what we're doing with it and why. So what you're seeing here is one of the wireless cams. You can have multiple, and this is, for those of you who are not familiar, a uh, fuzzy windsock windscreen with a Rode microphone. The idea behind this, go ahead and flip it back for me real quick. Um, the idea behind this setup is so that we can quickly produce these videos in the most efficient way and get the quality that we need without having a budget that breaks the bank. It would be really easy for us to try to do insane amounts of post editing and do studio lighting everywhere and, and try to dial in every setting. But the reality is having these quick setups that are budget friendly that we can take with us in small bags on our arm and go on site, things like that, which we'll probably be doing to do like demo videos, training videos, things like that. These types of setups are incredibly powerful to be able to quickly get out somewhere, video an episode and get it out there. So why is this important? Well, in a church, this is incredibly important in a small church, especially when you're trying to do things like live stream, especially in a non-service environment, because we all know, like, if you've got a worship service, you can install cameras and run wiring, but you may not always have that luxury. Well, these give you the ability to do it both wirelessly, through batteries, things like that. So you got a fall festival you want to live stream out in your parking lot? Here you go. So, in a nutshell, I'm not going to dig into that. We'll dig into that more and more. But this is to showcase a principle that we wanted to... The whole point of what we're trying to do is how to do things on a budget and actually fix real-world problems. So what you're going to see is each week we're being kind of intentional with the podcast episodes to show you that, okay, last week we had a little bit of trouble with audio being ringy in the room. Well, guess what? We introduced a new microphone based on things that we already have around or things that are very affordable. For instance, this microphone is only $50 on Amazon. Anyone who's ever shopped microphones knows $50 is not much. So this is just a good example. But anyway, I'm not going to dig too deeply in that. I just wanted to showcase that so that you can see each week things are going to get better progressively. Audio will get better, video will get better, and we'll try to do a quick little showcase of how we took one small issue and made it better. So anyway, back to the original topic, and then I'm going to hand this over to Rob because we're bringing two different, very different perspectives with us today. We both are musicians and we both are sound techs, but Rob plays more in the music world now. I do more of the sound tech world now. I've transitioned less away from music and more into uh, AV tech. So these two perspectives are gonna come in very handy when we're talking about in-ear monitoring. So what I wanted to do is we're gonna talk about, um, Stephen, if you'll flip it real quick and showcase the wedge on the floor. Um, this is a technology that pretty much everybody who watches this is probably gonna be familiar with, the floor wedge monitor. 
Um, so the history of this is basically we went from, I guess, just having what? Marshall amp stacks, things like that. Uh, yeah, back in the day when everybody had their own individual amp, they had a, a speaker hooked up to the keyboard and there was no mixing on it, period. So that's, I mean, yeah. that's really why we need monitoring in the first place. Or if there was mixing, it was a PV board with four knobs bigger than my hand. You know <laughs> what I mean? But we transitioned to this out of necessity. And then we're going to take that to the next level, which is personal in-ear monitors. That's the, the farthest step on this episode, but you can see where the wedges come from. Now we're dealing with powered wedges, so you don't even have to run amps in the back anymore. You can just run a mic cable from a mixer or heck, from a camera for all you need. You just need something to be able to hear. So what I want to do is I want to throw it over to Rob, and Rob's going to delve in a little bit, and we may bounce back and forth, but he's going to delve into the musician side of why it came from A to B. Let's start first from the walls of sound, as we like to call them, into the wedge monitors. Why was that a necessity from a musician's point of view? Well, from a musician's point of view, you, you need to be able to hear everybody that's playing. Uh, you need to hear every instrument, or at least most of the instruments, uh, and you have to be able to hear them while able to hear yourself. So if you've got this big wall of sound Marshall half stack, or, or we live in the praise and worship world, so I'd say a Vox half stack, uh, you've got a Vox AC30, that thing puts out it puts out a lot of power and in order to really get the sound shape that it, the way a guitar player wants it you have to get those tubes in that amp really working and get them hot and in order to do that it comes with just volume problems where you can't hear anything but the guitar um, when you have those kind of problems it's really hard for the band to stay together the the piano player or the keyboard player they're not going to be able to hear themselves over that so we really we needed a way to isolate that get that out of the picture and just move to one sound source that everybody can hear anything everything in and from sound man's perspective i'll even take it a step further um, we'll go into this on a future episode but even new tech there with what he's talking about some of the uh, companies, Blackstar, for instance, they have come out with uh, these blackface style fuzzy amps um, that are literally like one watt because, let's be honest, a 40 watt tube versus uh, uh, solid state amplifiers, like you said, it's just too loud. So now you have these little one watt setups and then there's also the next step of that, which is direct input, direct output, DODI type setups to where you don't even need a tube amp, you can model it. But that's for a different episode. So from this, yeah, you're dead on. The need arose, I need to be able to hear everything, but I need it mixed. So the sound man came into the picture and said, hey, well, I could just put another speaker in front of you and I can send a different routing to you. And it wasn't that simple. It, it obviously came over time with companies like Crate, PV, and the higher end Marshalls and stuff. They're like, hey, we have to build better mixers. We have to put speakers that can be controlled. Well, this introduced a new problem, two problems to be precise, from a sound man's perspective. That was the music's perspective from a wedge monitor, but the sound man has two major issues. First, bleed. Bleed is, simply put, the sound from the wedge bleeding into your stage volume and or your main volume. It makes it very hard to control room mix. The second major issue is the individual's need to hear specific things. So you can have 20 monitor mixes on stage, but the more you do, obviously, the more amp channels, the more cabling, the more power, blah, blah, blah. So from the sound man's perspective, wedges are great. They still are to this day. I'll, as a sound man, I'll tell you, I love wedge monitors, even over in-ear monitors in certain instances. Um, we'll get into that in a minute, but the idea is, as you can see from our, our camera shot, we still use wedge monitors today. Sometimes you just don't want ears in your ear, uh, headphones in your ear. Sometimes you just don't need a click track. Sometimes you don't need multi-tracks, things like that. These are things we're going to discuss. But the pros and cons from a sound man's perspective, like I said, you just you got bleed issues, you got stuff on your stage, things like that. So the necessity came about um, years ago. Studios always used metronomes and click tracks to try to keep everything together and 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 keep all the tracks timed appropriately. Someone somewhere to this day decided I need that live because I either don't have enough instrumentation or I need, let's be real, delay. Delay changed everything because delay matters with the tempo of the song. So somebody says I need to hear all that in time. So now you have a problem. Well, you can't realistically put a click track in a wedge monitor. Nobody wants to hear deep, doop, deep, doop, you know, that kind of stuff. So guitarists start using more and more delay 
So sound men are like, well, how do we do this? So somebody somewhere came up with personal in-ear mixers. So Stephen, flip it over to the mixer for us real quick. So what you're seeing right now is a Behringer P16 personal mixer. This is what we're gonna consider a budget-friendly personal mixer. There's many others. Allen and Heath makes them. Um, there's many companies that make these. They have different feature sets. They have different price points. Some of them have ambient mics, some of them don't. This is your, your industry standard. I need to upgrade, but I don't wanna spend the bank. So from a musician's perspective, Rob, I want you to look at that thing right there or, or virtually in your mind because you use these um, with us. What are the pros and cons of this thing and how do you use it? Um, well, what I really do, I have a lot of tips and tricks for these, which we we'll probably cover in another episode, how to use them effectively. Um, but the main thing is with these mixers, it allows me to hear exactly what I need to hear. Um, I'm a weird one. Most musicians only want to hear you know, certain instruments. Uh, certain things that they that they deem are important uh, if like they want to hear like uh, most guitar players will only want to hear the drums the bass and maybe the vocals so that they know where they're at in the song and this is deeply personal some guitar players may want to hear the more of the bass less of drums so to you and that's exactly what what those mixers allow for uh, the other thing that the mixers allow for is you can have the click track as loud as you want uh, me personally, I like to have my click uh, up in my left ear. I like to hear the drums in both ears. I like to hear the bass in my right ear. And that really spreads things out so your, your headphones don't sound muddy. That's a good point. And I'd like to take a second to just stop and talk about that right now. One thing, safety. Be very clear on this. Not using two headphones at the same time is dangerous. I won't get into the medical reasons, but there are medical reasons. For these that like to have one ear in and one ear out, don't anyway. And I'll tell you why that happens is because vocalists, they can't hear themselves well enough and they can't hear the, they can't hear the room as well. Yeah. And so they think that, the, that the, the greatest thing to do is to pull one out. Well, the problem is that they're going to mix so hot in the other ear that they're going to end up damaging their ear. Yes, and there is also an actual medical condition where it changes the balance of your ear, drum canals, the liquid. I, like I said, I, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not going to get into the specifics. But it has been proven over and over again, use two headphones or don't use them at all. That, that's the safety thing. And I can tell you from personal experience, I've seen the damage that is done. Um, no names mentioned. <laughs> but back to that original point, you can mix within the earphones and have the click over here, this over here. But the second part of that safety thing is this. Be careful with a click in your ear. A click in your ear at an excessive decibel volume will damage your hearing by itself even beyond the pull. So anyway, I just wanted to take a second and just give you that little quick, hey, be careful how you do this, the disclaimer. I'm sorry, I get distracted by that little fuzzy thing. That thing's awesome. <laughs> uh, Rob is apparently severely distracted by the fuzzy on the mic. I like the fuzzy on the mic. It definitely kicks down wind noise. It definitely kicks down room reverb. So it is a necessity, but they, they could have made it look less cute. <laughs> it, <laughs> it's cute. It looks like a gerbil or something sitting up there on the thing. <laughs> but anyway, back to, back to what I was saying. I'm, I'm a little bit different. I grew up in a, in a recording studio, so I like to hear everything at once. Yeah. And the problem with that is that it makes, you know, these tiny little in-ear monitors with, I have my personal ones have two drivers, so they don't, they don't have a lot of separation. So with me wanting to hear everything, I have to be able to pan some things left, some things right. The drums, like I said, I always want those dead center. Um, and I want to hear me dead center, and I tend to hear a lot of me. I wish sometimes that you could put more talent in the monitors, but <laughs> until they do that, I just have to, to settle gotta, with what I've you got. You got to step up the price point to get the talent. Yeah, the on. talent simulator. I would like to quickly point out one thing that he said, though. Um, the whole point of mixing the way he's talking about drums in the center, or at least some drums in the center, uh, guitar in the middle. This is actually a mixing technique for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's stereo imaging your mix. Um, you can also surround sound image your mix, if, your, your mix if you're so lucky as to have multiple speakers and understand it. Um, it's a pain. Don't do it in a live worship scenario. <laughs> um, but the point he's making is that I wanted to hit on is some musicians have sound tech experience or at least understanding of sound tech. Mm -hmm. And they understand how to set a stereo image. This is crucial if you want a really blended sound in your ears and you want to move with that. From a sound tech's perspective, that's awesome when a musician has that sound level experience. But out of 20 musicians, one, maybe two, have that experience. So here comes the con of the in-ear mixing that I wanted to just touch on really quickly. I love that musicians can control their own mix. I love that they do. 
However, when it doesn't work right, or when the mix just doesn't dial in like you want it to, and you don't understand how limiters, compressors, stereo panning, and things like that work, it becomes potentially a pain point for a sound engineer because now they're having to step in and do. Um, no problem. Um, that's actually a good point. That's another thing we're going to talk about in another episode, and that is automating so that multiple people can run it, but we're not going to get there. So you heard someone talking about potentially Alexa to turn on lights, sound systems, things like that. So uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, and this is the other thing about recording and, and, and mixing in live environments. It's a live environment. People come and go, so you have to be aware of that. So you need isolation sometimes. You need better setups to account for that. Anyway, I'm not going to dig into that rabbit hole. But back to that point, um, as a sound man's perspective, it can be difficult at times when your musicians, while they have all the good intentions in the world, you spend more time than you really intended to actually have to go up there and tweak a mix in their ears because they can't really get the vocals out in front of anything. So anyway, um, take that to the next level for us. And okay, now you've got your personal in-ear mixer. Now you've got a mix in your ears that you like. Yes. What about things like delay, tap delay, things like that. Where does that take it from just being able to hear better to actually making you a better musician? Um, all of my delays, I don't ever really use those for delay. I use the delay on, because I use, I live in the modeler world. I, I don't do use too. actual physical amps. I have a modeler. And the other great thing about the in-ear monitors is with a modeler, I'm hearing exactly what's coming from the soundboard. I'm not hearing, uh, anything being distorted by any kind of speaker. It's all right there in my ears and I'm not, I'm only hearing what I want to hear. Now my tap delay on my modeler, if I, if I'm using delay, which let's face it, I'm in the praise and worship world. I use reverb and delay a lot. Maybe more than needed, but hey. <laughs> if you don't sound like the edge from U2, then I mean, are you even really trying? And just for those who aren't technically familiar with the terminology, uh, I will tell you what it's called. It's called fully saturating a preamp. Um, you don't necessarily always get it, but if your gain structure is correct, then you've sent as much gain into the preamp as you possibly can without over distorting or clipping. That's the true tone he's talking about in his ears is that fully saturated preamp that you can't get with tube amps unless you fully saturate the tube, in which case, now you're counting everybody's ears. <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. And, and, and the great thing is I can make it sound like I'm standing in front of two separate Vox AC30s cranked all the way up to 11, and on stage, you don't hear any of it. Um, it's very quiet, nothing bleeds into other microphones. Uh, having a silent stage is just, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to communicate with the team, and that's, that's the, really the downside of, of in-ear monitors. Uh, communications with your sound tech, communications <laughs> with, your, with your rest of your team, with your worship leader, does tend to get a little bit trickier, but when you look at the, the the payoff, I mean, the juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah, and that's an interesting point, communication with an inner system. This is where your budget can actually hinder more than help. In our case, you can find ways to work around it, but certain in-ear monitors like these, the P16s, or inner mixers, I should say, um, don't have an ambient mic built in. So the ambient miking is what a lot of vocalists and guitarists are missing that they want to take their ear out. You, there's ways to get around that. For instance, if you have a pulpit mic, an altar mic, that kind of thing, you can turn it up, or a mic on a piano. There are open mics in a lot of cases that you can use to build that ambience, but it's hard to mimic the sound of a room fully by one mic in the middle of the room. So this is where the struggle becomes real. And what I see with a lot of churches, uh, what I see them doing is they'll take a microphone and just dedicate it to, they will have it sitting at the bottom of the stage facing the congregation, and they will just dedicate that to an ambience mic that just picks up the service. But here's the problem, good example. Is the congregation what I wanna hear in an ambient mic? Yeah, probably some, but a lot of the musicians are wanting to hear themselves bouncing off the walls and things. So there's always this struggle of where to place it, how many to use, you might be limited on channels. I mean, a lot of times 32 channels is all you got. Well, if you're using 29 of them and you get a choir, you might not have an ambient mic channel. You just gotta get creative. This is where the budget part comes in. Use good equipment at a reasonable price. Use what you have already if you can, make it work. But the other point I was gonna make very quickly is drum isolation. And we're not gonna get into the, the, the depth of tr uh, drum isolation, sorry, just swallowed up a fuzzy apparently. Um, 
But in our setup, our drummer is in a professionally built drum booth. Well, it's a wonderful thing from a sound man's perspective, but communication-wise, it can be troubling at times because now you have to have an actual microphone to talk to them or hand signals or something like that. So to your point, in-ears do have some kind of cons, they have some hard cons, they have some good pros, but with anything, there's always ups and downs, you can figure it out. But I would like to say from a sound man's perspective, using a modeler direct and using in-ear monitors is one of the best setups that I've ever used. Now, truest guitar players, some of them are just not gonna like that setup. They want the tube, they want the sound. But that clean sound silent stage is what I as a sound man really strive for. You know, no hisses, no buzzes, no extra cabling that's not needed, no extra sounds that aren't needed. God, I can't tell you how many times I've got vocal mics picking up tube bleed, you know, that kind of stuff. And it's just, it, it can warm up the sound, but it can also destroy it just so fast. And the feedback. Let's oh, not yeah. forget the feedback. Now, I will, I will, thank you for that. I will elaborate on that for a second. That has, personal in-ear mixers and, and in-ear monitors have been the greatest strive forward in elimination of feedback since probably uh, dynamic microphones. Like back when they had ribbon microphones and things in studios and that's all they had, feedback was horribly difficult to control. Well, now you have personal in-ear mixers, the wedges were the, the, the bleed from the wedges and the feedback from the microphones going into them was the single biggest problem we fought most of the time. So now these have helped a lot. So I do like them. Now, we're gonna hit on the final part of this. We're gonna delve into the thing that we're gonna go into in another episode, but for this discussion, is multi-tracks and click track. Okay, these are things that have taken on a new perspective in praise and worship especially. I haven't really seen it creep as much into secular. Um, not that people don't use multi-tracks, but I'm sure it's m much more common in uh, praise and worship environments. But the necessity of being able to hear that in ear ears instead of in a wedge monitors, the click especially, but even multi-tracks. Some of these multi-tracks have instrumentation that's out the wazoo, for lack of a better word. Do you really need all that in a wedge monitor? No, you need it in your ears, but you don't necessarily need it on the floor. So, from a perspective of a musician, using a multi-track setup with in-ear monitoring, what does it allow you to do? What door does it open for you to be able to know that you've got this track to lean on and you can now just layer on top of it? Oh, there's actually a lot of really good points. Um... For starters, the click. The click is the most important thing. Um, as a drummer, the click is my absolute best friend. Uh, as a guitar player, I still use it. It's but a love-hate relationship. Yeah, I, I don't hate the click. I, I never do hate the click. Um, it really, it takes the pressure off of the drummer uh, as far as keeping time because when a drummer gets excited, you know, the world tends to slow down a little bit. Adrenaline starts going and then they speed up, they slow down, you know, they, they, they barge ahead, they drag, they're in front of the track, they're in, or they're in front of time, they're behind time. Uh, the click really solves all of that. If you get good at playing with a click and you bury the click, which means you're hitting the drum that you need to hit on the click, you don't even notice that the click is there. That's, that's when you get that symbiotic relationship and it really, it, it takes on a whole new life and it, it just brings out the joy of being a drummer. Uh, now there are drummers that on the other side of that that absolutely hate the click and I used to be there until I started playing with one and then I was like you know what this is my new best friend. Uh, the next thing that it brings is one of the problems if you don't have the vocals turned up is you'll forget where you are in the song. Oh yeah the dynamic cues yeah that's they, cues are my second best yeah, friend. With multi-tracks, cues are a big deal because that's one of the missing things that they brought that I actually do like as a sound man is the uh, in the cues if you're not familiar with them and we're going to actually uh, mention them in the episode about multi-tracks but a couple of the tools that you can do this have cues built in obviously somebody had to record them but you can use them and it has um, verse chorus bridge these kind of things to guide you where you're going versus having to rely on a praise leader to give you a hand signal or just multiple practice rounds to memorize where it goes so as a crutch, and that's a negative word, sometimes it is a negative thing, but in this case it's a positive thing, it is a nice crutch to have when your practice time is limited, uh, when you've got to reproduce quickly, and you've got to reproduce effectively. Go ahead. Well, here's the thing, especially, you know, us in the praise and worship world, we're doing new songs all the time, we're doing 
in, in average, I'd say most churches probably do four to five songs in a service or three to five songs in a service. So you're having to learn these songs and have them ready to go week by week by week. If you have a lot of musicians and you're rotating people out, that means you're not necessarily getting all the practice time in. Um, and, well, and you and lose also, the jail, too. Y- you do. Uh, certain musicians being tight with each other. So. And then you have issues where um, you have some worship leaders are really busy or they, they have a, a different way of picking the music, and that means that you don't get the songs until Tuesday or Wednesday. Well, your practice is Thursday, it's a song you don't know, and you, especially if you don't read music, that puts a lot of stress on you. And those cues, they don't fix all those problems, but they definitely help. Yeah, it, it's, I won't say it's a lifesaver, but it's a life preserver. You know what I mean? It, it keeps you moving, which is the key thing in, in week to week. And I agree with that fully. Uh, as a musician as myself, um, having that crutch to lean on can be handy. But I will take a step in the other direction and be the devil's advocate on this one. The click. The cues are awesome, but that click. I agree fundamentally as a music person, a music major, the click fundamentally is the best thing for a lining up time uh, across multiple takes, things like that. The only problem I have, and it's a big one, but I think it's been abused too much, is it becomes too much of a crutch for some people. When you've got a band that gels really well, it's been practicing and playing together, and you take a click and you use it week in and week out on every practice, every song, what you lose is that ebb and flow of some songs that you have to have. I miss that. That's just me being on a soapbox. I'm going to be on, and I'm not literally on a soapbox, am I? No. Okay. This thing kind of looked weird. Also. <laughs> anyway, that's my soapbox for the day is I do love these things, these technology things that come forward, the click, the tracks, the cues. But where I think we are losing a little bit of feel is the, the click is becoming a crutch and not just a tool to help. It's not always the case, but in my view, it's in praise and worship especially, it's almost like as soon as you walk in on stage, you get that click going, you know? And it's amazing when you've got musicians that don't play every week together to just keep that in line, keep that time going. But when you got a song that you really want to slow down, like for an invitation and let it flow, kind of hard to do, especially when you got one clicking on an iPad going in front of you and you all of a sudden stop that click. Oh, it's like somebody just took a helium balloon and went, <laughs> So anyway, that's the only negative I'll give on the click. Um, well, in a nutshell, do you, you have anything else from the music perspective? No, I was gonna say I was just gonna say yeah, when that click stops working, you feel it, and yeah. that adrenaline gets going again. It's kind of like a sound system. It is an amazing thing until it stops, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, I get it. Anyway, to wrap up this episode, um, we're gonna have some more uh, delve in episodes. We're actually gonna take a. Uh, uh, deep dive session on these P16s to just showcase them, uh, give you a price point, why we believe they're a good budget offering. Um, but that's for a different episode, and we'll give you a walkthrough tutorial on how we use them, as well as other ways you can use them and, and uh, setups and things. But to kind of circle back, the whole idea here is in ear monitors, um, they've created monsters. They've helped fix a lot of real world problems, which is what we're all about. And they've also taken a, a spot in a, I don't even really know how to word this, but it's amazing to me that per- personal in-ear mixers have gotten into places where change is not readily accepted. Um, <clears throat> churches. Uh, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm dealing with that right now. Yeah, so we all know where that is. I'm not gonna <laughs> dig into that, but the point is, this is tech that would not be readily accepted in a church normally, but because of the necessity and what it actually fixes, it's actually cementing itself as a, a critical piece of a contemporary or blended service. It's still a little bit of a, a hesitation on traditional services, but even traditionals use mixers. Uh, our traditional service uses in-ear mixers, but you've just got some people, you know, pianist especially, and this is not a shot against pianists, they are just so used to the ambient, uh, the ambiance of the piano that when you put headphones in, it completely sucks the oxygen out of whatever they're playing. So anyway, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say in rambling way is in-ear monitors are a wonderful thing. They are a blessing if they're used correctly. Don't spend more than you need to spend. Um, find some good budget alternatives like these. Implement them in your church and do it slowly in a way that you can teach people the right way to use them. Don't just come in one day with eight of these suckers and say, hey, we're going to in-ear monitors. You won't like it. (laughs) Um, 
Rob, you are in your current church. Are you not already? You're looking at implementing these right yes. now, aren't you? Um, Go ahead. What I was uh, what I was talking about. I think it was our last episode. What I was talking about was uh, we have a new praise team. We also have a choir. Well, we're dealing with the issue of not everybody gets to hear themselves or what they need to hear in the wedge monitors that have been there for 60 years. Uh, so we have, right now we're looking at, at getting some P16s. We just got an X32 board and the P16s, I mean, they just plug and play with that. Yeah, that is a nice feature of this set. So we're, we're right now looking at getting, you know, a few, I still got, you know, my three of my piano players that don't want the in-ears. Um, I've like got <laughs> <laughs> my drummer. He wants them in the worst way. Everybody that's up on the stage, because my drummer, my bass player, my bass player doesn't want in ears because he uses an amplifier that's mic'd. He likes to be able to hear himself from there. But they're in a, they're in a musician's pit off the stage, so it doesn't create that much of a noise issue. I would like to take just a split second to talk about bass players because guess what I am. <laughs> um, bass players <coughs> do bring an interesting twist to this discussion that we didn't hit on and I'd really like to and that is frequency of vibration okay guitarists pianists keyboard players whatever most of them vocalists can deal with in-ears without major issues basses present a specific problem because headphones unless you get a really high-end pair don't support the low-end frequencies as well this is where you need a 12 inch or a 15 inch speaker now every sound man out there probably twinges and they're like I don't want a 15 on my stage but if you get good ones and you get ones that are controllable, it really adds an element of clarity to the mix and to the musicians on stage as well because you can now feel it outside of the subwoofers of the mains. So the point I'm getting at without going too deep is your bassist, you do have to usually allow a little extra and put them an amp on the stage because I, as a bassist, I can tell you without the quad driver ultra headphones, I cannot feel the low frequencies of probably your E string or lower. So that is one thing that in-ears have not solved yet. And that's one thing we need to look at uh, going into for a further episode. They actually make things that the bass player can stand on that yeah, replicate those frequencies. Best butt device kickers. ever made, butt kickers. Um, yeah, we'll go into that for sure. And I actually can't, uh, just thought of another idea based off a comment you made for a future episode. Um, and it slipped my mind. Shoot. <laughs> but you made a comment, and I was like, ooh, we need to talk about that. It's uh, uh, Anyway, we'll keep Catch going. it in the replay. Yeah, we'll get it in the replay. But anyway... Um, join us on our next episode. Um, to be determined at this point, we're still trying to get the, the layout of these going. Um, if you have ideas or whatever, please comment, let us know, things like that. Uh, we're going to wrap this one up. I hope you enjoyed it. We do. We enjoy doing these. Uh, let us know how you feel about them, what you think about them. Uh, anyway, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Good evening.